Today, on Call Out, Nelson Search and Rescue is en route to search for a missing jet skier. Nobody can find him. They just uh, found the jet ski floating, so we're responding right now to see if we can uh, find the gentleman and hopefully have a good outcome. And later, dealing with mission stress from Search and Rescue. It was just a circus. I mean, the, the parents were, were screaming, the mom was screaming. Saturday, 4.28 p.m. Nelson Search and Rescue was called out to a jet ski incident east of Nelson on Kootenay Lake. We've been called out for um, Marine Rescue. There's a uh, jet skier about 45 minutes ago that had some form of distress. Uh, he's been off his machine, no thermal protection, no PFD and in the water for almost an hour now. Nobody can find him. They just uh, found the jet ski floating, so we're responding right now to see if we can uh, find the gentleman and hopefully have a good outcome. Situations like this, you have to gather most of the information when you get there. There's only a few kilometers away, a few minutes by boat. We rocketed down there. We could see in the distance a jet ski being towed by a boat, and there was a boat approaching us. We talked to the folks in the first boat. All right. And where's the girl? Just inside the bay. They told us there had been two people on a jet ski that had had an accident. One was on shore. One has been missing for almost an hour at this point. Well, this changes everything. Not going anywhere. We're uh, going to go and make contact with a girl right now and uh, get the actual story here. Copy. Someone's been missing for an hour. Someone's on shore. We need to take care of that person first and get a first-hand account of what happened. The team goes directly to a nearby dock where a local resident is waving them in. I got there within five minutes. Okay. The resident describes how he used a small boat to tow the jet ski and female passenger to the beach. Is she with anybody? There is somebody. Okay. He informs the Nelson team that the young woman is up at one of the cabins. Chris Armstrong goes to investigate. These are tough situations. Coming into this, knowing there's a lot of emotion, she told me that she was doubling on a jet ski with another gentleman. Quite a large wind had come up, kicked up a lot of waves on the lake. They had made a hard turn, and they were both thrown from the machine. The gentleman was between her and the machine. The wind pushed the machine further and further from them. The gentleman tried to swim back to the boat, was having trouble getting there. She swam to him, tried to help. She couldn't do anything and needed to save herself. The team focuses its energy on getting the female subject medical attention. Go ahead. Uh, we're transporting the young lady who's got a, a bang shin, minor injury. Copy. She's in shock. She's been through a traumatic experience. Our first priority is to transport her to BC Ambulance, make sure she's in good hands and good care. Many times, even when a subject is not physically injured, they will be packaged and cared for just to help minimize the emotional stress of the situation. Once she was packaged and taken care of by BC Ambulance, we had a big job ahead of us. We have a missing person who's now hour 45 minutes missing. It's starting to get dark. We have very little time to get something done. Figures from the beach dock to the dolphin straight out. 150. Now, with additional members on board, the Nelson team returns to the location where the subject was last seen. Sides here nice and high. Two people off the front nice and high and just see if we can see them. As a search helicopter flies overhead, they will conduct a surface grid search in the fading light and then use underwater drop cameras after dark. To aid in the search, they will employ the use of a forward-looking infrared scanner to detect heat signatures in the water. It's the right shape, color, and everything in it. We're doing I gotcha. grid searches here. We've seen something in the water floating. It looks uh, the right color and shape, so we're going to go right now and check it out. I can't tell. We're rocking too much. Yeah, it looks like it's him. Yeah. Is it a deadhead? It's a log, eh? Yeah. There's two of them.
the sighting turns out to be a half-submerged log, or deadhead, as it's known in boating jargon. No, but keep in mind, this is where everything's floating, so... Darkness sets in, and the team stays at it, using drop video cameras equipped with lights to search the bottom for the missing subject. After several hours, it's dark. We're all tired. We've pretty much done all we can for the evening. The decision is made. We'll come back in the morning. We'll wait till the sun hits the water. A helicopter in the air, cameras at the bottom. We'll find them. We've come back out this morning to uh, see if we can find our missing subject. We have a helicopter coming up. But as soon as we get some sunshine on the water here, uh, the subject's located about 50 feet of water, so we've flown the area a few times and we've, we've always been able to see right to the bottom, so we're hoping that uh, possibly locate the subject at the bottom somewhere, mark it with the boat, and we'll wait for the RCMP dive team this afternoon to come up and do the recovery. The underwater cameras go into the lake once again, grid searching the bottom to find the missing jet skier. It's a big area to search. Our cameras only cover a few feet of bottom at one time. So we have to be very careful how we use our time. First thing we do, we estimate where the point last seen was. We GPS that location. From that location, we use the GPS plotter to create grids. So we're crossing back and forth in layers across the bottom, looking at only a few feet of the bottom at one time. It's a long process. At the same time, we have a helicopter in the air. This is a river. There is current in the water. If the subject has drifted or moved downstream, we have to use that helicopter to search the whole corridor, see if we can find him elsewhere. The helicopter is doing a much broader search. Nearly four hours later, the search continues. It's about 10 o'clock now. The sun's high in the sky here. We're gonna get the helicopter back up to uh, see if we can find the subject on the bottom here. 20 to 50 feet of water. Our drop cameras right now, we've turned the lights off on the lenses, so the sun's illuminating the bottom enough we can see a much bigger area, so it's kind of prime time. Hopefully we can uh, shorten the search with the helicopter real quick. I think we'll do okay. There's not much current in the bottom, so hopefully we're successful family and friends have come out to help with the search. Situations like this, everyone wants to help. The whole community is concerned. Family, public, there's many boats on the water all doing the same thing. We searched the whole area, and it's a big area. We were going to spell off some of our members and bring on some new members to continue the search. We went back to the dock, dropped some members off, headed back out. A few minutes later, found him. I'm about to run out of cable. You need to give us some power. It's about 12 o'clock here. We've uh, been successful with the drop camera. We've located the subject in about 50 feet of water. Um, we've marked the area with a marker here and we're just standing by. The search is now complete and the subject is being located. However, as they move into the recovery phase, there's a problem. The RCMP dive team is unable to get to the site until the next day. In this situation, our local RCMP dive team members were away in another part of the province doing ongoing training. This means we had to wait for other members to come from around the province to do the actual recovery. This creates a sensitive situation. The family needs closure, and everyone involved in the rescue needs that closure. In the end, the only course of action possible was to wait till the next day to do the recovery. The area was marked with a boy we stayed for as long as we could, then we left to return the next day. It's Monday morning. We're heading out to meet the RCB dive team to do the recovery of our subject from yesterday. We're just going to run out here and meet them, come up with a game plan, and uh, get the job done. The RCMP dive team arrives by air and land. They've come from all over the province and are ready to get the job done. Because this is an on-call task for them outside the regular duties as police officers,
Coordinating dive team members and resources can sometimes be the most challenging aspect of the dives they do. We will be diving at 34 feet to recover the body. Our primary task will be to photograph, then recover the body and do a post-mortem uh, inspection and then before we turn her over to the coroner's investigation. The RCMP dive team ties up alongside the Nelson SAR boat, which will be used as a recovery platform and base of operations for the mission. An RCMP diver goes down with an underwater camera to photograph the scene. All aspects of the recovery are carefully documented. A second diver enters the water to assist with the recovery of the body. The coroner and the RCMP conduct a preliminary survey of the subject after being brought on board the SAR boat. Transporting the subject right now back to Nelson to meet the coroner and uh, the funeral home to transfer the subject. Um, after the uh, initial recovery there, we went over to the dock where um, the family was. The family identified the subject as being the subject uh, in, in question. Um, these things are always emotional, but uh, it went very professional. And everyone was uh, kept it together. So we're just going to head up here now, meet the coroner, and uh, transfer the subject over, and we'll be done. It's been a long three days for the Nelson Search and Rescue Team, and every minute of those days is volunteered. The team giving their time to find the subject and helping to bring closure to the family and to the community. This is a sad situation for everyone involved. You gotta prepare for what could happen. The heavy waves, wind, no PFD. You never know what Mother Nature is gonna bring to the table. Now, learning to deal with emotional trauma in search and rescue. I grabbed the pole and managed to feel around the bottom of the pool for him and got him up close enough that I could drop the pole and grab the boy. When search and rescue teams are on a mission, the dangers are not just physical. There are emotional risks as well. It can be traumatic work. SAR member Gary Swan knows what it's like. He attended a call out for a boy who had fallen off a cliff into a pool of violent water. It was a fairly popular swimming hole. Uh, I'm familiar with it. I grew up near it. I used to swim there myself. Um, and it was just a circus. I mean, the, the parents were, were screaming, the mom was screaming. And I grabbed the pole and managed to feel around the bottom of the pool for him and got him up close enough that I could drop the pole and grab the boy and the paramedics were there and, and it was uh, just a mob scene of course but we worked real hard on this kid to try to get him going and it, it became pretty clear that you know things weren't going well the boy did not survive it wasn't until after when it was over and i was taking my gear off that it really hit me like what what we just did and when, who that subject was he was just a kid I mean, same size as my boy, um, it was rough. I looked at the situation a lot afterwards. What the hell could I have done better? What did I do wrong? It weighed very heavily on my mind. Gary's reaction to his experience is called critical incident stress. When mission trauma occurs, specially trained members are on hand to provide SISM, critical incident stress management. All of a sudden, he was laid in. We provide psychological first aid to those uh, volunteers. We find this really helps the SAR volunteer as an individual. It helps their families, but it also helps them stay with search and rescue. I disassociate. Using search and rescue peers to do the SISM intervention helps the affected team members let their guard down. It helps you put it into the past. Peers are much more accepted by SAR volunteers then, for instance, a mental health professional. The volunteer peers walk the walk, talk the talk. There's no stigma associated with a peer. I might check in with you just uh, tomorrow and just see how you're doing. I appreciate that. At a weekend workshop in Campbell River on Vancouver Island, 
eight SAR members from across the province of British Columbia are being trained to do SISM interventions. I am not a psychologist, I'm not a clinician, I'm just a guy. So we're not gonna be doing counseling, we're not gonna be doing therapy, all we're doing is emotional first aid, that's basically what this is. You're dealing with people in their most vulnerable emotional times and they deserve to have well-qualified, well-trained people to help them. There are different types of SISM interventions. Demobilization is used at the end of each day of a prolonged and usually challenging mission. This is just a way of funneling those people at the end of their shift into a controlled environment, getting people to sort of just transition back into normal life instead of saying, okay, your shift's done, everyone get in their car and go home. That's kind of hard when you've been maybe, you know, recovering body parts all day and you know you're gonna have to come back the next day and do it all over again. The public needs stress management too, especially in smaller towns where most residents know each other and the subjects involved. You could give people an opportunity to ask questions like when are the funeral arrangements going to be made? What information do, do the police have? If, if this was something large that happened in a, in a community or a very large uh, search. The intervention Gary went through was a diffusing. Diffusings are held in private immediately after an event. It forces you to talk about it, to get it out, and uh, it makes, when you go home, it's done. SISM interventions help put the volunteers' experience in perspective. Sheila Sweatman, a local Nelson artist and recent member in training, went through a debriefing after treating a severely injured subject during her very first call out as a volunteer first aid attendant. I just finished my occupational first aid and acted as the first aid attendant for a subject who had large amounts of trauma to his head and uh, the rest of his body as well. It was like I kind of left my body in a sense and we just did our job that we had to do and I don't feel like I really returned to my body for a few days. Um, I can't really describe what it was like when I was doing what I was doing. Um, I was glad that I was able to respond with the skills that I'd been taught and uh, somewhat successfully because um, even though we weren't able to re have the subject survive, um, I know that what I was doing was working to the extent that what I could do. And um, it was kind of a helpless situation. Going to the critical incident stress debrief the following day was super beneficial so that I knew that what I had experienced was real and it was just good to know that other people had experienced the same situation but from a different perspective. Everybody kind of just looked at me and said, it's okay, nobody could have done much better. So that was kind of reassuring. Sheila, you ready to lower? Ready. I think lower. I'd like to try again and hopefully have a subject who's a little bit more responsive and potential to survive is a little greater. If you don't treat critical incident stress, there is a potential that you can develop post-traumatic stress disorder. That is a much more serious problem that requires significant mental health resources to correct. People who've experienced stress are advised to avoid replaying the incident in their minds. That replay re-traumatizes you and creates more chemicals. So it's a, uh, what, what you want to do is, if you start thinking about what happened, try and distract yourself with something else. We'll talk about particular calls, sometimes for years later. Remember that when, when we hauled that guy out or we found those bones or whatever? And it still comes up. But this one is just one of those ones that's going to stick with me for a while. But I, uh, I credit the SISM teams for um, helping you get out there, just get it out and deal with it. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, 
filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv. Yeah.